Thanks for joining us on Power Lunch. This is Bloomberg Quint. I'm Harsha Subramani. Good afternoon. I'm Ira Dugal. Let's get you the headlines this afternoon. Indian benchmark indices set for the first quarterly decline since December of 2016 as metal and energy stocks prove to be the biggest drags. Fortis Healthcare will demerge its hospital business into Manipal hospitals to create the country's largest hospital chain. The stock falls as markets are unimpressed with the deal valuation. Ultratech, Cements and Binani Industries continue to try and attempt to convince lenders to accept their offer. Lenders still looking for some legal comfort. That's a Bloomberg Quint exclusive. HEL lists at a 4% discount to its issue price today. This after LIC had to bail out its IPO. The SEBI board meets today to take up the proposal to dilute listing norms for insolvent companies. May also look at algo trading frameworks and buyback rules. We'll get to all of that uh, in a moment, but let's a quick, quick check on how the markets are faring. Uh, Neeraj is here, as always, to tell us what's headed. Yeah, so it, it's good that uh, we, we're in a scenario like this, Asha, because every day we talk about what the markets could do mm. and wouldn't do. And I think it's pointless talking about that because of the gyrations that we have in the mother market, right? Mm. But today, the standout feature is that the smallest piece of bad news the stocks are getting butchered in trade. Mm. Um, starting with the mid caps today, not the large caps necessarily, but look at the reaction on persistent systems. Mm. The stock is down 10% because the IP revenues will fall slightly more than what was anticipated. Mm. This is a marquee mid-cap IT company which has not rallied as much as some of the others and it's down 10.5% in trade. 703 for persistent. Uh, look at what's happened to Fortis and I'm sure you guys will talk about it in greater detail but 13% the last time I saw 13.5% now and trading at the lowest point of the day. So there was some selling and there is some more selling during the course of the day after a correction. Typically people tend to say that hey a correction has happened now let's wait for a bounce. I don't think that is happening in Fortis's case. Mm. Look at Delta Corp. Um, there is a rise in fees. You don't know whether the management will be able to pass it or no. But the fear of the fact that there could be further more restrictions that could come in or higher fees that could come in on casinos in Goa and 10% down on 7.5 million shares traded. Uh, there's a lot of punishment being meted out to stocks on the whiff of small news that just gives you a sense of where the market is, uh, to be honestly. Uh, and in the large cap space, I think upstream is down. Uh, so ONGC, Reliance, etc., are all down in trade. That gives you a sense of uh, what could be the principal contributors to the downtick uh, in the session today. Very few gainers as well. Maybe that is adding to the woes. But half a percent will be a bit more volatile towards the close because it's expiry day, quarter end, mm -hmm. month end, uh, whatever, what have you. But yeah, I expect some volatility during the course of the day. But honestly, I don't think it's possible to predict these days even for the best of day traders or positional traders as to what the markets will do over the course of the next couple of days because it's very, very choppy. All right, Neeraj, thanks so much uh, for that. That's the market check here on Power Lunch. Uh, let's move on to the big uh, corporate story of the day. Continues to be Fortis Healthcare, the plan to sell all its hospitals to Manipal Health. Uh, the deal will, of course, create the largest hospital chain by revenue. Uh, since last night, when the announcement came in, a whole bunch of analysis has been done, and we've also heard from the management. Darshan is standing by uh, with, firstly, the key numbers behind the deal. Darshan. Yeah, so basically, if you're looking at it, the stock is down 13%. Not the best deals that, uh, you know, Fortis actually was looking at or the minority shareholders of Fortis were looking at. So basically, let's just uh, take a look at, uh, you know, uh, firstly, what the scheme is. So basically, what will happen is that the hospital business will be housed into a separate subsidiary that will be demerged and that will be merged uh, into Fortis, uh, into Manipal. So what's the second thing is that uh, the, the hospital business will be demerged and it will be transferred to Manipal Health. The merger ratio of this uh, entire deal will be 100 shares of Fortis will get you 10.83 shares of uh, Manipal. Manipal also will put in funds to acquire the RHT assets and after everything is done, uh, Manipal Hospital will be listed on the stock exchanges because of a reverse merger uh, that will happen with the demerged entity of Fortis Healthcare. So this is part one of the entire deal. The second part is Fortis Malar which is up in trade which is another listed company that will get an indirect open offer that will be there but the important part is SRL Logistics. Now uh, Manipal Health will, will actually purchase 20% of uh, SRL logistic uh, for SRL diagnostic bar for 720 crores and uh, because of this uh, uh, you know uh, Manipal is also looking to acquire the balance shareholding to get a majority stake in SRL diagnostic now basically SRL diagnostic is important the deal values SRL at uh, 
3,600 crores, much lower than the analyst rate. The street was anticipating in an excess of 4,000 crores to come in. Uh, the EV to EBITDA is 21.5 times on, on, on this entire deal. The second part is, is the fact that how will the shareholding be? So post this entire deal, 41% uh, of Manipal uh, will be owned by public, 38% by the promoters. TPG will be 20.7% and uh, they, will, they will get in all, they are looking to get in 50.9% stake into SRL and 100% of RHT assets. So this is the entire deal, how it will work out. Now, in terms of what will this mean for the combined entity, uh, presence both in North and South India, Fortis has 34 beds, uh, 34 hospitals, uh, Manipal has 11 hospitals, with a combined bench, uh, bed strength or in excess of almost 7,000 uh, beds. So this is uh, the synergies that they are getting in because of this entire deal. Secondly is the financials. Uh, Fortis has almost doubled the revenues of uh, Manipal, uh, but margins are almost 6.4% and, and, and equal uh, debt holding on both this company. So they will have a 14.2% uh, uh, EBITDA margin with a revenue of 5,000 crores and a debt of 3,600 crores. So this is how the combined entity will look at. The combined entity will be the largest in terms of revenues and EBITDA uh, in India. Uh, second largest in terms of operational beds and hospitals and thirdly if you're looking at it it will be third in terms of the occupancy uh, average uh, uh, time spent on uh, 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 this is uh, an average uh, length of stay and average revenue per bed so that's the entire combined entity that uh, uh, you know Fortis Manipal will have yes, very quickly so if uh, for a, for a shareholder of Fortis uh, what part of it works and what part of it does not work? So basically what doesn't work is the valuation because they have, haven't given any kind of clarity in terms of what the valuation is there. So firstly what works? So the combined entity will be the India's largest hospital chain. So that works for it. Manipal has uh, you know, uh, you know, a track record in operating facilities. Uh, that is something that works for them. And thirdly, pan-India presence. Now what is more important and why the stock is down almost 14%, what doesn't work? A lot of people had bought this share in anticipation of an open offer that will come in. That has has not come so that is where you know a lot of uh, unwinding of positions has happened you remember it's the last day of uh, fortis in the fno uh, deal valuations are not mentioned there's no clarity on it but on the face of it if you do a backward calculation it seems that the valuation is done at almost a 10 to 15 percent lower than the market cap of fortis at this point of time there is no clarity on the liabilities of the sfio probe that is there and that is also something that you know uh, the management said that you know all liabilities will stay within the company itself so if there is something fortis will have to pay it and Manipal is valued at a higher level than Fortis despite its revenues being half of Fortis. So Manipal has managed to squeeze out Fortis in all areas of this entire deal and SRL valuations are much lower than estimates. So not the best deal for the minority shareholders and that's why you're seeing a selling of almost 13% uh, on, uh, on Fortis. But uh, the management spoke to the media. Uh, let's hear in what they had to say on this deal. In any scenario, uh, because the hospitals are being coming out and demerging with the business and going back into, not going back into, sorry, going into the Manipal entity. Uh, legal entities, as they are, will, will stay within the entities and hopefully quite honestly resolved. I mean, uh, you know, the, the idea is not to hold on to entity, uh, legal issues or liabilities for any length of time, but hopefully resolve and move forward as well. TPG Manipal will be investing into the SRL business. Um, we will be, today Fortis Healthcare owns 56, 57 percent of the SRL business. Uh, we will be selling 20 percent of our business. From a start to finish, we've just announced it yesterday, I think this could take anywhere from 8 to 10 to 12 months. So the SRL, the 36 percent, the balance of the business that's going to stay in FHL uh, will be staying in the Fortis Healthcare entity. Um, that entity will own 36 percent. And we'll have a, a plan to grow the business. So there is the FHL entity will become a health care um, entity that will be focusing on health care enterprises. So in addition to what it has with SRL, it will then look to raise cash and to explore investments in other related businesses, related parties that um, related, not parties, related businesses that, um, that um, are consistent with that philosophy. Bhavdeep Singh of Fortis. Let's move on. Our market regulator SEBI will discuss a slew of measures at its board meeting today from strengthening the algo trading framework to norms for insolvent companies. Uh, there's a lot on the agenda. Sajid is here to tell us uh, what's expected. Sajid. You know, uh, this board meeting will look at some of the uh, changes to the uh, uh, listing norms, especially with respect to insolvent companies, because uh, there is now that many of the companies are, go, uh, are in the last stages of uh, IBC proceedings, uh, there will be uh, some violations of listing norms because the public shareholding will fall because uh, 
pricing and the stake which these companies will get it get uh, in these companies will be much lower than the required so there will be some exemptions provided by that uh, and that's what service board is going to look at uh, there will be some penal structure which will be put in place for auditors uh, for failing to do the fiduciary duty uh, of not reporting defaults or uh, you know frauds in the company and that's something which has been uh, talked about in the last in the recent past because you have a couple of cases where defaults and other uh, you know uh, intra-group transfer of funds or misuse of funds have not been reported properly so that's where uh, something go uh, going to come in buyback regulation is something where uh, there will be some kind of uh, uh, regulation changes with respect to when a buyback can be done uh, especially two consecutive buybacks what the time duration could be uh, there is all these are all part of it and finally there could be a discussion on the quarter committee report because this is something which is coming in for last two uh, board meetings La, even in the last board meeting they, they couldn't discuss it because of positive of time uh, but uh, we were told that it will be done picked up in next board meeting so this is on governance this is on governance uh, all those uh, radical changes which the quarter committee spoke about and the government was opposing and other lots, lots of uh, to and fro uh, on that there could be a discussion on it. Uh, whether there will be a decision on it it's, it's unlikely but there would be some kind of uh, discussion coming in and then there's an expectation of on the you know default circular which was pulled back by mm. SEBI uh, now that RBI has come out and said that the banks should disclose within a period of time mm. uh, SEBI could you know align itself with the RBI regulation and say that companies should also do it or uh, rating credit rating agencies should also do it do the same so that could be something which could be coming in into this board meeting all right, Sadiq, thanks so much. We'll await all the uh, decisions from SEBI later in the day. On to a Bloomberg Quint exclusive. Ultratech and Binani Industries are persisting in their efforts to convince lenders that their bid for Binani Cements is superior to the one offered by Dalmia Bharat. Remember, there are almost 15 cases in court being fought on this particular issue, but back-channel talks have also continued. Vishwanath Nair uh, has been speaking to bankers and joins us uh, with what's been transpiring over the last few days. Vishwanath. So uh, this has started over the weekend and then it's, uh, it's gone on for the last uh, couple of days as well. Um, the lenders basically uh, are in conversations with uh, Binani and Ultratech and or representatives from both camps uh, trying to uh, figure out whether they can actually sign on to the Ultratech deal. Remember the Ultratech deal was 7,300 crore in exchange for about 98% uh, equity uh, stake in Binani Cement. Mm. Um, this was an understanding that Binani Industries, which is the parent company, and Ultratech entered into outside of the insolvency process. And Binani Industries, following this, uh, went and filed a petition with the NCLT saying that the, uh, the insolvency process should be stopped because clearly this uh, method was giving them more cash. Now, what we understand is that the lenders are, uh, are interested. They are looking at this deal as a possible opportunity for, uh, for them to take, up, take it up. But uh, they don't want to take it up right now because there's a ton of legal hassle that come along with it. Uh, remember that the only uh, you know, institution with the power to stop an insolvency process at this point in time is the Supreme Court. Mm. So unless Supreme Court intervenes and says, you know, uh, this Ultratech deal is fine and that, uh, that the lenders can stop the insolvency process and give it uh, to Ultratech, um, uh, they, they can't really stick their neck out and say, okay, we want this deal. Uh, another issue is also Dalmia Group, which was uh, selected as a preferred bidder under the insolvency process. So in case if the deal goes to in, in Ultratech's favor, then Dalmia will start its own uh, you know, petitions against the whole process. And they'll say that you know, it's unfair that they were selected and then not given the company. So all of these legal issues aside, uh, the lenders seem to be suggesting, and that this is something that the bankers we spoke to have said, that you know they are interested in the deal, they, they like the deal. They would prefer if Ultratech would pay off all the secured creditors uh, first off, and then uh, deal with the uh, operation creditors and strategic creditors, trying to get them on board as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and everybody get, goes home happy because people are paid off in full. Probably the first case where people are fighting to pay back the full money <laughs> rather, than, <laughs> rather than taking a haircut, so you know, that's interesting. Vishnu, thank you so much for that. Let's uh, move on now and talk about an IPO. Uh, HAL, Hindustan Aeronautics, had a rather muted listing today. Uh, the country's largest defense maker, which also happens to be the last company to get listed on the bourses in fiscal 18, listed at a discount of 4% and has been hovering around the same level right now. The company's chairman and MD remains optimistic about the future growth prospects, stating, uh, saying that the helicopter aircraft maker is on the verge of getting a new order from the Indian Armed Forces. In the current order book, what we have is to supply the remaining uh, fighter aeroplanes, which you started delivering it from last few years. And uh, we could uh, sign a contract on the supply of about a few new helicopters to our services. So this makes it uh, 
uh, I mean, if you're looking at a robust order book, that if you're looking at the kind of a turnover what we're looking is about 17,000 to 20,000 in between. So it would give us about three, three and a half years run from now. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the products which we are designed and developed, like a light combat helicopter or the, the trainers, basic trainers, and these would give us definitely the numbers to be the future. Uh, and as we are the, the largest aviation industry and the biggest defense uh, public sector, uh, and we've been supplying the platforms to the Indian uh, defense forces like Indian Army, Indian Navy, Indian Air Force, Indian Coast Guard. So the requirement is specific and the supplier is unique. So I think we would be very comfortable into the future. And uh, I have no doubts that uh, there's any concern or a cost to look worried. So there isn't a risk with just concentration on one client, as you mentioned, the Indian Armed Forces? No, this, this industry is a unique industry. Like even if you look at the world, and then each country has one odd uh, company to do this. There can't be many. When you are a platform maker, a big man is only one. But then the people who make the aggregates for it and supplies to it, there could be many. The ecosystem of an aviation industry, especially in the defense, could be large. Uh, but the supplies would be from one single source mostly because the guarantees and warranties and the technology which is involved, I mean, it's a very highly process oriented. And then you, you have can't just take any risk on the quality part of it. So there would be an integrator who is responsible for the performance of the product. Uh, in the world, if you see like, uh, as I stated before, uh, Boeing in America, uh, Airbus in France, um, and HL in India. Uh, speaking about the exports now, like in your speech also you mentioned there are opportunities to grow the exports. So what are those opportunities that we are looking at and any order that you, are, you already have received or are expecting uh, from international borders? This being uh, defense products and then the internal demand is being served by HL all along. Now, as the indigenous products have proved its performance, like the advanced light helicopter, which could be used as a, uh, uh, the cargo or the ambulance or an executive uh, travel or the troop carrier, it has a very multiple roles which could be done and it has proved its uh, performance in Indian skies. So there are a lot of opportunities for these kind of products to be exported. We do have discussions onto it and then as on date, uh, for our light combat helicopter, we do have the government clearance to for export. And uh, the future is that the HL would concentrate more on uh, while we serve the internal demand, at the same time we look at the outside market. Uh, also speaking about the numbers, the financials, uh, where do you expect to close FY18 in terms of your margins and top line? Uh, we have a memorandum of understanding with uh, the administrative ministry and uh, the figures are in the public domain and we will not fall short of anyone on the committed numbers. Final question from my side, like uh, the government's new uh, defense procurement policy, uh, where do you see the role of PSU and how would you uh, benefit from this? If you see the, the, the draft policy which is put on the net and uh, with the DPS, is I think very clear parallel. I think I don't, if I recollect properly, it is 5.2 or something, where it says definitely for HL and the products which we are putting onto it, and it is really encouraging for us to see a kind of a policy which is put on the draft. Incidentally, Life Insurance Corporation of India had bought into 70% of the HAL IPO, which begs the question, has LIC had to offer similar support to other uh, government IPOs? Swamit Sarkar has some very interesting data. Swamit. So yes, they did uh, give some similar support to other companies or other government IPOs also. In fact, they bailed out four government IPOs out of the seven uh, IPOs that launched in financial year 2018, putting in close to 14,373 crore rupees. Now, if you see, uh, Seven companies raised close to 29,000 crore rupees in the primary markets in financial year 2018, of which 49% was, at least 49% was invested by LIC in these companies. Now, if you see the next table, you can clearly see how uh, the GIC was raising close to 11,373 crore rupees. Of this, 
5,641, that is close to 50% of the offer size was put in by uh, LIC. In New India Assurance, they put in close to 60% and in Hindustan Aeronautics, it was the highest at 2,844, that was 70% that LIC has put in out of the total offer size. For Cochin Shipyard, they, they must have put in but th their holding must be below 1%, that's the reason it has not been disclosed, so we don't know about that. Similar was the case for Hudco. For Bharat Dynamics, they put in only 175 crore, that was around 18% and Mishra Dhartu Nikam is yet to list, so we'll have to see how much LIC holds in this, so we don't have the data for uh, Mishra Dhartu Nikam as of now. Now, if you see government companies in financial year 2018 have dominated the primary market. Now, close to 81,600 crore was raised in the primary markets in financial year 2018. Of that, 36% was raised by government companies, that is close to 29,100 crore rupees, while the remaining 64% by other companies. Now, most of the money raised by government companies was through offer for sale. Nearly 85% of the amount that government companies raised was taken by the government while the 15% was used by the companies. Now, generally 2018 was the best year for IPOs if you see volume wise. Nearly 45 companies raised close to 81,000. Uh, this number is wrong. It's not 81,722. It is 81,600 crore rupees. Uh, 45 companies have raised. And of these 45 companies, 17 companies are trading below their issue price. 23 companies are trading above the issue price. And 5 companies are yet to list and will be listing in the next financial years. So, I mean, thank you for that. Let's move on now and talk about GST. Shortfall in GST collections continue. Tax collections for the month of February are the lowest in three months at 85,175 crore. The argument is that February is a 28-day month. So, if we regularize it to an ordinary 30-day month, we would add about 10% and that would amount to 93,691 93, crore in revenue. Problem is, that's still way short of the 1.1 lakh crore per month targeted in the budget for fiscal 19. Also not encouraging is the data on, on, on filing. About 59 or 59.51 lakh GSTR 3B returns were filed as of 26 March as compared to the 57.78 lakh filed in January. And it gets worse. Only 69% of the 86 lakh eligible taxpayers filed the GSTR 3B returns in February. Now government officials say that it will all get better when the e-way bill is implemented. But Pratik Jain of PwC does not agree. In an earlier conversation earlier today with Bloomberg Quinn, he says, e-way bills alone will not do the trick and many structural changes will be required. You know, I don't think uh, really e-way bill will make a huge difference because uh, anyway, there are very many states who had uh, this kind of system earlier also. And I haven't seen any empirical evidence to say that uh, those states have done better than other states. Uh, but uh, but let's keep our fingers crossed, as you said. I mean, I think uh, you know the government believes that uh, the difference between you know what we mentioned about one lakh twelve thousand crores odd and eighty six thousand crore that they're collecting now on an average will be largely met up by uh, by eBay bill. <clears throat> but a couple of points I would want to highlight. I think when the rate cuts happened in November, mid November, uh, the uh, the impact that the government said on a on a fiscal would be around twenty thousand crore a year because of the rate cut. And maybe they won't want to uh, review that because uh, because the, really the collections are going down. In the first three months, July, August, September, you were around 92, 93,000 crores on an average. Now you are around 85, 86. So if the difference is largely attributed to the rate cuts, then that 20,000 crore estimate you know, has to be has to be looked at. And obviously, I mean, um, I think there are there are cases where there is a large scale of evasion happening. Uh, the smaller dealers, the competition dealers, you know, uh, recently few people were arrested because they were running a fake invoice uh, racket and things like that. As the data gets richer, with the data, na you know, the, which is available with the government, they can do sophisticated data or data analytics to see, you know, which are the pockets where uh, evasion is happening more. Okay. Uh, so I think all these things, eBay bill included, uh, should should see a revenue uh, push uh, in the coming uh, coming months. I think March. Should uh, should be more than one lakh crore to my mind. Okay, because uh, of the Pratik, two uh, questions. One tongue in well. cheek. Uh, How so, many months so have you been telling me see, the next yeah, month will yeah. be better? <laughs> no, no, I, I don't answer I, that. You know, we'll I, save you that one. I Second agree. question, so you may not want to answer this government. either. Second question, you may not want to answer this either, given that you live in Delhi and very close to the seat of power. Are you really suggesting an increase in rates? That would make you the single most unpopular person in this country. <laughs> no, no, I'm not suggesting rate, uh, rate increase, but what I, oh, I'm only suggesting that the, the estimate of 20,000 crores because of the rate cut from 28 to 18, perhaps needs a review. Okay. The second thing is that we were expecting that lot many items which are under 28% right now 
will also be brought down to 18, which includes cements and paints and cameras and refrigerators and air conditioners, etc. I don't think that's going to happen any so I mean, sooner now because the government wants to stabilize uh, you know, uh, the collection. And also some of the structural changes, like petroleum products coming in, in under GST. Those kind of decisions the government will not be willing to take right now because unless the, the revenue collection stabilize, they don't want or they would not want to do any structural changes. So in that sense, it's not only the collections coming down, but it will, in, in a sense, hamper uh, the further... Uh, you know, improvement on GST that we were all uh, expecting. Fair enough. One quick last question, 30 second answer. Compliance rate of roughly about 69-70%. Not very encouraging, uh, you know, minor blip up in terms of filings, but very, very minor. Uh, you know, really do you think that the next year's revenue targets are doable? Looks difficult to me. I mean, I think at this point in time, if you ask me 7,40,000 crore of GST collection next year, which roughly works to 61,000 crore of central GST every month, it looks like a tall order to me. I mean, and on the compliance side, I agree, 69% is still lower, marginally improved over the last, uh, last month. Uh, 3B is a very simple return, a one-page return. Why are people not filing it? I, I don't have an answer. I think a lot of people who have got registered are not doing any business, and they should just allow them to cancel the registration because the data, uh, you know, 69% may not be the accurate data because a lot many people who are there registered may not be required to file because they're not doing any business. So that's also possible. So that, that's something which the government needs to look at. GST Network's interim chairman Ajay Bhushan Pandey says he's confident that e-way bills will roll out uh, without much hurdles this time around when they come into effect from the 1st of April. Speaking to Bloomberg, Quince Nikunjori, he says that the entire back end is now ready. Whenever you uh, implement any large system, and this is a live system, right? And whenever you roll out any large system like this, where crores of e uh, e will, will get generated, lakhs of people are become the user of the system, you know, there could be in, e in the initial phases uh, some issues. So based on our experience, uh, this time, you know, the extensive testing has been done, and then the assurance has been given by NIC that this time, you know, th the system should work. And sir, uh, there were also mismatches found by the government in GSTR 3B and GSTR R1 returns. So what was the quantum of that and what steps is the government taking so that people stop evading, evading paying of tax? You see, there, you know, there could be various reasons for the difference in the GSTR 3B and GSTR 1, right? Uh, there could be some genuine, uh, 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 you know, uh, yeah, you know, there could be some genuine difficulty or, you know, there could be some error or there could be somewhere, you know, where somebody has tried to give two different figures in two different returns. So appropriate views are being taken by the, uh, by the tax officials. So it is the domain of the tax officials to find out the difference and then take a view as to whether it is a deliberate non-compliance or whether it is a mistake. If there is a mistake, you know, those mistakes will be addressed. If there is a, some deliberate attempt, the tax administration, like, you know, the state tax authorities or the CBEC, whoever domain this whole system is, is they will take a view on this and then they will take an appropriate action. All right, let's move on and talk about Ola and Uber, the lure of the Ola Uber economy is waning in job starved India. The two cab hailing giants have been consistently cutting their incentives for their drivers, and it's just not lucrative anymore. Take a look at this report. शुरू में मतलब डेली हम लोग पांच से सात हजार कमा लेते थे मतलब उसमें ओला का कमीशन देता था तो सब कर्वल कर हम लोगों कुछ तीन हजार ऐसा बेनिफिट हो जाता था आराम के साथ हाँ आराम के साथ में अब जैसे कि मैं सब कुछ ऐसा 
बुरा भी ऐसा निकल रहा है मुझसे कि मतलब कुत्ते की तरह मर मर कर कि दिन भर में हम लोग कुछ कमाने पा रहे हैं दिन में हम लोग जब भी सोलह घंटा जब गाड़ी चलाएंगे जब भी हम लोग को इसमें से हजार रुपया बचता है लेकिन सोलह घंटा अगर गाड़ी हम लोग चलाते हैं तो सोलह घंटे एक ही दिन तो चलाना नहीं है दूसरे दो दिन रोज चलाने गाड़ी तो सोलह घंटे चला के दूसरे दिन कैसे चलाएंगे गाड़ी बॉम्बे सेंट्रल पे थ्री फोर्टी वन पर मैंने ड्रॉप किया है उसके बाद अभी मुझे ट्रिप लगी है क्योंकि मेरा इंसेंटिव के करीब हो गया है मेरा तीन हज़ार सत्ताईस रुपये इंसेंटिव हुआ है ये ऑपरेटर बिल हुआ है और मुझे सिर्फ नौ सौ चाहिए मेरा एम बी जी कम्प्लीट होने के लिए तो इन्होंने मेरा ट्रिप बंद कर दिया पी कॉर में तो लॉन्ग ड्राइव नहीं देता लॉन्ग दो तीन किलोमीटर खाली ड्रॉप देता चार किलोमीटर पिकअप देता पाँच किलोमीटर पिकअप देता दो किलोमीटर ड्रॉप देता हमको कितना तीस रुपये डालता है चालीस रुपये डालता है उसका हमको तो बहुत लास्ट हो पहले तो सही पे होता था सर एक महीना वो कम से कम एक एक लाख बीस हजार तीस हजार तक होता सर अभी पूरा रात दिन पूरा गाड़ी चलाने से भी एटी थाउजेंड सेवेंटी थाउजेंड हो रहा है अस्सी नब्बे एक तक हम दो लोग मिलकर करते थे सर समझ गए इतना तो हम कर लेते थे मगर अभी सर उसका आधा हो गया है अभी बीस हजार महीने का कमाने के लिए बहुत तकलीफ है हमारा गाड़ी तो ये हम ये पंद्रह हजार महीने का भरने का हमारा बाड़ा हमारा ये कुछ भी मिल रहा ही नहीं है हमको किसके लिए ड्यूटी करने का ऐसा हो गया हम मैं पहला इसका ओला ऊबर में का, करने के लिए मैं नवा गाड़ी एक्सेंट गाड़ी रखा था इसका ये लोग सभी इंसेंट सभी स्टाफ किया मैं वन वन ईयर हो गया था मेरा नवा गाड़ी शोर माला ले लिया मेरे को वो ये में भरने के नहीं हो गया मैंने इंडिका लिया था मैं ढाई लाख रुपया कर्जे में हो गया सर सौ रुपये ट्रिप पे काम करते करते उसको मैंने चुका है वो भी अभी तक तो मेरा चुका नहीं है डेढ़ साल से सिर्फ मैं कर्जे पेड़ रहा हूँ और मेरे जीजा जो है उनका तो ऐसा हो गया कि बैंक वाले को बुलाकर गाड़ी सरेंडर करना पड़ा हम लोगों को तो कैसे भी करके करना ही पड़ेगा कितना भी 16 घंटा लगे 18 घंटा लगे तो करना ही पड़ेगा क्योंकि हम लोग अभी फंस गए तो उसके पहले अगर मालूम रहता है ऐसा कंडीशन है तो मैं 3 लाख रुपए मेरा जो मैंने जो डिपोजिट डाला है गाड़ी में वो रखता और कोई पंद्रह सोलह हजार का नौकरी कर ये अपने दिल की बात सर मैं बता रहा हूँ तीन महीना चार महीना हो गया सर अकाउंट में एक पैसा भी नहीं गया है ये सिर्फ बर्बादी और कुछ नहीं है पहले ऐसा अगर दे गए तो हो सकता है नहीं तो कुछ नहीं हो सकता सर All right, we'll step into a quick break on that note. We'll come back uh, with more markets and also get you Manish Sundhalia of uh, Motila Loswal, who's betting on India's consumption story. इसी तरह बच्चों के साथ साथ बढ़ते हैं एल के चिल्ड्रंस प्लान जो दे आकर्षक भुगतान बच्चों की हर बढ़ती अवस्था में बड़ो, बड़ो, बड़ो मेरे Sorry, क्या हुआ कुछ नहीं यार जस्ट वर्किंग ऑन माई एक्सपेंशन प्लान फंडिंग का चक्कर इट इज सो फ्रस्ट्रेटिंग आई फील बैंगिंग माई हेड अगेंस्ट दॉ नो नो डोट बैंग यू हेड Cross the bridge instead. Bridge? Huh? Here they. La. Arey. This bridge gets you in touch with interested investors. Funding happens, which means more outlets, more customers. Interesting. And what exactly is this bridge? A stock exchange created for your kind of company. Just list on it and help your business expand. Really? Yeah. So, then list it. Or what? Shubh Kamal, dear, who is talking? एन एस सी मार्च साथ हमारा सफलता आपकी दी एस एम ग्रोथ प्लेटफॉर्म फ्रॉम इंडिया लार्जेस्ट स्टॉक एक्सचेंज व्हाइट शर्ट कितने प्लेन और सिंपल फॉक्स सेंट प्लेन और सिंपल व्हाइट शर्ट को बना दे स्पेशल और फैशनेबल फॉक्स सेंट न्यू फैशन वेयर फॉर मैन Anything and everything about your investments. 
with just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Back on lunch, the headlines at this hour. Markets under pressure ahead of expiry. Mid-cap index fall in, in line with benchmarks. Heavyweights Reliance, ICSI and Infosys head lower. China confirms King Jong-un's visit to Beijing, says the North Korean leader has pledged to work towards denuclearizing the Korean peninsula. Mark Zuckerberg has agreed to testify before the US Congress in, in April over the Cambridge Analytica data breach. All right, now before we get to those stories, let's dip back into the markets. About a half a percent lower on the Sensex and the Nifty. Agam's here with the movers this afternoon. Afternoon, Agam. Afternoon, Rita. Well, uh, considering its expiry, we've certainly seen a pickup in rollovers uh, with respect to the Nifty as well as the Nifty Bank. Especially, of course, uh, both these indices have declined by as much as half a percent for now, and we are looking at some amount of uh, weakness. When it comes to rollovers, or rather, uh, beg your pardon, turnovers, uh, for the cash market stands at around 20,000 crores at around 130 largely in line with the average of the previous three days. However, as one might expect, uh, the turnovers in the, uh, the futures and options space have picked up quite substantially. In fact, uh, it's just moved above the mark of 9 lakh uh, crore rupees. That said, in terms of uh, you know, your uh, broader markets, they are moving largely in line with the, the benchmark indices that is falling. And we have seen some weakness coming along uh, with both these indices, the mid-cap as the small-cap indices uh, falling by as much as 8 tenths of a percent. Uh, in terms of sectoral indices, uh, we do have two sectors which are moving in and out of the, the green. That is the auto and the IT sector. So those are the sectors which are outperforming the rest of the markets. On the other hand, substantial weakness in public sector banks as well as the metal companies. And with respect to some gainers on the Nifty 2, we're looking at gains in something like a Maruti Suzuki, Wipro and Tech Mahindra along with uh, Hero Motor Corp. And on the losing end, we have Tata Steel and Adani Ports. Uh, each of these stocks losing out uh, around 3%. Uh, thanks for that, Agam. Today is the last day, thus trading day in the financial year 2018, while Indian markets have lost steam over the last couple of months. The benchmark indices have lost more than 3%. Investors actually look forward for some healthy returns over the entire financial year. Jayesh has put together a list of some of those top sectoral performance and, uh, and laggards in this fiscal. Jayesh. So, Hasha, it's uh, been, uh, you know, not uh, the best of years that we have uh, in terms of the fiscal years. Let's have a look at, uh, you know, uh, firstly, the market cap that got added for all the BSE listed stocks. That was uh, just above 13 lakh 40 thousand crores. For the NSE listed stocks, uh, 13 lakh 20 thousand odd crores. Now, uh, you know, what has actually co contributed to this uh, was the domestic institutions. They pumped in more than 1 lakh crores and the FIs uh, pumped in more than 20 thousand crores for the fiscal year 18. Now, you know, why I was saying that uh, it's not been one of the best years. Uh, this this picture will actually show you. For FY18, the Nifty has given you as much as 11%, uh, give or take a little bit. Uh, but you know there have been instances in the past where the Nifty has given you better returns. So for FY17, 15, and 14, the return was much better, barring FY16, where you have a negative return of about nine odd percent. Let's have a look at uh, you know the broader markets, what they have done broadly in line. And in fact, the uh, small cap index has given you uh, more return than the Nifty index itself, uh, whereas the mid cap index has given you lesser return than the uh, Nifty index. Now, uh, let's have a look at you know what what played out this particular year was volatility. Now. You can see that, you know, that's the one-year chart of the India Wix. Uh, largely till August, September, we had, you know, very stable movement in the volatility index. But from there onwards, it has picked up and has given you about 25% in the entire year. Uh, in terms of the sectors that have out outperformed and underperformed, uh, Nifty Realty, that has given you about, uh, you know, more than 30% return. This is the highest return that it has generated in the last eight odd years, followed by the Nifty IT, Nifty Metal, and the Nifty Bank index. In terms of the laggards that we have, uh, two sectors really stood out. That was the Nifty PSU Bank Index and the Nifty Pharma Index. Now, the Nifty Pharma Index, that is on track to give you negative return for the third consecutive fiscal year, uh, you know, down about 18, 18.5%. 18 
let's have a look at uh, some of the stocks that actually uh, outperformed and underperformed for the nifty mid cap and the small cap indices uh, if we can pull up that chart uh, you'll see that you know from the nifty's uh, gain gainers list you have bajaj finance followed by hindustan unilever uh, maruti suzuki and reliance industries also that has given you anywhere from about 40 to 50% return in terms of the losers uh, you know lupin was the was the top loser on the nifty that lost about uh, 48% followed by lot of other pharma names on that list so you have aurobindo pharma dr reddy's uh, sun pharma as well in that list let's go on to the mid cap space and see what has actually performed well and not done that well so you had graphite india which has given you more than six times return avenue supermarkets jubilant food works and india bulls real estate uh, more than doubling the money for uh, you know uh, the investors while on the losing end you had uh, something like a reliance communications and suzlon that did not do well losing more than 40% each All right, Jayesh. Thanks so much. Uh, that's the year-end data from a trading perspective. Uh, in India, it's becoming a ritual. Each year, investors are assured that earnings are about to recover. Each year, they don't. But there might be some improvement this year, not in the earnings, but in how well analysts are forecasting earnings. Nupur Acharya of Bloomberg News is here with us. Nupur, are these very highly paid analysts getting good at their job finally? Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> the the result of the pudding is finally in the eating. But uh, so every year, as you mentioned, you know, fund managers will keep will you know kept on asking the same question: When will the earnings come to justify these kind of prices? Now we seem uh, it appears that they are coming to some kind of an understanding. Mm. I won't say that the twain shall meet, <laughs> but uh, the expectations and the reality, the gap between them has narrowed. And I think the fund managers have are confident. They have never been so confident in the last three years mm. that earnings would. pick up and as you mentioned just before we you know what we were listening to the top performing stocks that is the primary reason why they believe that you know earnings are going to pick up you have the marutis of the world you know the one of the top performers there hindustan unilever bajaj finance so pick up in consumer you know commercial vehicle sales passenger vehicle sales two wheeler sales retail finance these are those green shoots which are giving that confidence that an otherwise bleak scenario this is a silver lining okay let's bring up that chart on the screen you know uh, specifically on on the uh, earnings expectations and uh, the actual actual earnings on the ground um, talk us through this no but this is more about uh, analysts reducing their expectations as opposed to earnings actually recovering and so finally they are they are looking at the real picture they are that euphoria is finally settling down mm. so they had an average estimate of 18% kind of growth which they have scaled down to about half so now the picture looks much more uh, much more clearer and much more realistic Uh, as we can say and there are of course good signs that earnings are picking up mm. and the caveat always remains banks we all know that there are skeletons are still tumbling out of the bank closets mm. so bank is uh, you know despite being the largest chunk in the whole you know financial indexes it has to remain away but the rest of the them are showing some kind of growth no put uh, in defense of these analysts not that i want to defend them i'll take you back to the time that you used to cover monetary policy the days when the chief economic advisor would come out every month and say inflation is going to come down and it would go up so maybe the analysts are not the only ones my lips wrong. are sealed my lips are sealed <laughs> neither mr patel says much neither will i <laughs> <laughs> well played okay let's move on uh, 2018 has not been a great year for did beginning for uh, indian equities manish santhalia of motilal oswal sees ne- no reason into panic he says the sell off is just part of an ongoing correction in our special series alpha moguls suntalia speaks about opportunities in the consumption space also terms psu banks as a bottomless pit listen in we are made of uh, we don't have nerves of steel we have nerves of titanium <laughs> okay so uh, nothing really shakes us so it's a part of a ongoing correction we'll see some more correction maybe you know people uh, with uh, um, with some you know if they excesses on the downside they will be excesses on the if they excesses on the upside they will be excesses on the downside we saw excesses on the upside at 11000 something on the nifty you know clearly these were excesses now we are approaching a situation where there excesses getting created on the downside so you know you know these are how tops and bottoms are made you know so currently the base formation is underway you know maybe it will fall another 5% or there about thereby you know you will see far more rationality come through in the market because earnings are picking up and the ultimate truth in the markets and stocks are earnings you know p multiples are nobody is are in nobody's hands you know they were not in anybody's hands when the markets were going up they are not in anybody's hands when the markets are you have got to actually factor in all the negatives at a particular price level and i think we are somewhere closer to the bottom 
That's how I would look at it. Then nothing to get very panicky about all these things. Well, that's good to hear. But just wondering, Manish, it's a thousand point fall that we've seen from the highs. You are saying that this is excessive? I mean, thousand points on the large cap. Hmm. But if you were to see the broader markets, there are stocks which have fallen 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. I mean, these are clearly excesses on the downside. Don't really think that there was so much of froth in many of the established marquee names. Yes, they have gone through multiple corrections, like PE multiple corrections. But nothing to warrant this sort of a panic. I think it's got to do with the negative flows that have come through from RBI's front on account of the PSUs, and liquidity issues, and so on and so forth. But my personal sense is that we are, you know, creating excesses on the negative side. So, you know, these sort of things really won't last too long. You know, if the earnings growth is there and capital will always chase growth, we are approaching that sort of a situation currently. Let's talk about how are you challenging or questioning your assumptions when it comes to the consumption space because you clearly sold on that. Oh, absolutely. And I, I have uh, always maintained that consumption has a long way to go into in, in India. You know, it's one of the basic pillars of the Indian economy. Not only durables, but even staples. And this has to do with increase in per capita income and people migrating to cities, etc. You know, so discretionary spend is actually going to grow. And even within the staples, is going to be premiumization, which is going to drive growth. These are very good businesses. These are high cash flow generating businesses. They're, you know, uh, you don't require that much more capital to reinvest to generate. Uh, so, you know, dividend payout ability of these companies stay very, very good. You know, all these years when we were in a deflationary, or let's not call it deflationary, disinflationary environment where oil prices, etc., were falling, it was more to do with only volumes growth. Right? Now, in an inflationary environment, it's also going to be pricing growth. Right? And with, let's say, both the pricing and the volumes come through, is going to weigh positively on the top line. Trickle down impact will flow into the beta and the pat. So the growth for consumer names works positively in an inflationary environment more than what it plays in a deflationary environment. Of course, out here, you know, creation of jobs is very important, which is anemic in our country, and let's say uh, private sector capex. These are the two missing points in our economy. It's not happening. It's going to be about market share shift in a GST environment. Right? These three things boil down into st specific stock pickings. Okay. And you try to hold it for long periods of time. That's what it is. But you tend, you would buy them afresh because you would have a large portion of your portfolio in consumer names already. Are you putting fresh money to work out there in that portfolio? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, if different names or the same names? No, even different names. You know, like uh, many of the large cap names also would be considered very favorably. I mean, just to give you an example, Hindustan Lever today, being such a large company in the FMCG space, have you seen the volumes growth, what they have clocked? 12% mm. volume growth, I mean, on a very large base. How is that happening? You know, so premiumization, penetration, you know, distribution, these are the areas where they're working on. Plus GST benefit. I mean, can you imagine, let's say, uh, Hindustan Unilever clocking a 20% earnings growth? Even if you have bought it slightly expensive, how does it matter? There's a long way to go. So longevity of growth creates wealth for people in the stock market. It's not your buying price. How much of cash flow this company is going to make over long periods of time? If you buy high quality businesses, even at slightly elevated prices, nothing will happen. But if you have businesses which are broken, broken business models at a fair price also, that's going to be destructive for wealth creation. So in the consumption space, you're seeing high quality businesses, cash flow generating businesses coming up and giving you opportunities. And, and, and which is my but part two of my question, is that why these businesses are trading at such, such, such significant premiums to their long term averages as well? We just did a study where in HUL, uh, the long term five year, the five year average P, the 10 year was even lesser, but the five year average P at 44, that's trading at about what, uh, 60? 40, no, something like 50, 55. 55 100. times, yeah. yeah, right? One year forward numbers. Yeah, so, so that's not cheap. So it's not very cheap, hmm. you know, but uh, uh, can it become cheap? Of course, when market falls, everything can fall. Sure. You know, but the point to ask is, or the question to ask is whether after falling, these stocks will actually go up. If you have broken business models, they will fall permanently. But these companies, because you know, you are front ending the growth in terms of P multiples. You know, the growth may remain stagnant for some time. 
you know, like what happened in Nestle when there was no growth. The stock didn't tank. It went through a time correction. So Hindustan Unilever may go through time correction, right? You not see too much of damage in price correction. As and when the growth picks up, there will come a point in time when the next round of growth looks very cheap. So let's say 1300 rupees, it stays here for let's say one year, okay, and a 20% growth. Suddenly it becomes 40p. Maybe it will stay there for another one year. I'm just yeah. making a hypothesis, right? It becomes a 30p. At 30p, you say there's still a long way to go in the case of what happened? You just went through time correction. Of course, that's an opportunity lost. But you'll have to take that call into buying good businesses or great businesses at a fair price or a great price vis-a-vis -vis buying businesses at a bad businesses at a very cheap price. Hmm. That's a call you have to take. You, that's your style of investing. Sure. I'm not saying what is right, what is wrong. Of course. There are different styles of investing. Somebody may want to buy something which is valued at rupees 10 at 2 rupees and still make money saying that I bought it 2 and sold at 10, but it was, I don't, I don't care about that business. Maybe a good business, maybe a bad business. That's one style of investing. Contra, deep value, whatever. I'm not in that camp. I'm buying something which is, let's say, at 10 rupees. Maybe I'm buying at 7 rupees. That sort of margin where I don't have too much of margin. But I know this 10 rupees is going to become 100. And I've got to play that journey from 10 to 100. That's my style of it. The sector which has been bombed out, undoubtedly, is the PSC banking space. Are you looking at it at all? It's beyond me. It's beyond <laughs> you. <laughs> no, so, so the whole problem is, you know, the dimension of the problem keeps on changing. Huh. Right? We, we started with, let's say, 10% of the banking system being NPA, you know, and you have a provision on that count, so you are left with this amount of shortfall which has to be bridged by way of capital infusion, etc., etc. We thought that 2 lakh 13,000 crores, if it is infused as capital, would solve the problem. You have a new RBI circular, now the amount of stress in the system is anywhere between 15 and 20 lakhs. I mean, where does the capital come from? And is it the end of the road as far as the recognition of the problem is concerned? I don't know. So if you are not able to understand the extent of the damage uh, which is to be there, how do you take a call on valuations? Uh, so, I mean, they will, they will come a time when they're screaming value to bit, but as, as of now, it's like a bottomless pit. You know, can't really think of the extent of damage. We'll have to change our stance uh, as and when the situation arises, when you get us. But my sense is this whole thing is not going to get solved before 2020. You know, the, the, the complexity of the problem is not going to end anytime soon. In fact, it might just see a sharp shoot up and then maybe it starts to subside, you know, but I'm totally away from PSB. You're almost extending a sigh out here right now, Manish. No, because, because you know, two years ago, I was mentally prepared that two years down the line, things are going to be very different. It's going to be very positive. And this was the thought process in 2016. We are in 2018. We are in a bigger problem. Yeah, true. So trying to predict next two years when you know that, you know, a whole lot of things are happening in this space. What in the recent six months or nine months that we, the last last we spoke in person was probably nine months away or maybe something like that, wherein you've spotted a business, wherein you rubbed your hands in glee and said, wow, that looks fantastic. I mean, a, a theme, a sector, maybe a business, but we don't want to talk stocks really. But, you know, something out here wherein you really thought that this was an opportunity that you'd be waiting for maybe for the last 12, 18 odd months, if not a lifetime. No, so there are many names and I think with the GST environment now underway, you know, if you understand the dynamics of that business in the unorganized space, there are a plethora of opportunities even today. Okay. You, you uh, really... Yeah, the electrical cable space, 60% of the market being in the unorganized space. So what do you do? I mean, there will be some players who are going to... Be, I think the big round of multi-baggers is going to come from the shift from unorganized to organized. On to some international news. China has confirmed that Kim Jong-un visited Xi Jinping. The conversation between the two is said to have included North Korea's nuclear weapons program uh, and its meeting uh, with the U.S. Bloomberg News' Stephen Engel reports.
Uh, well, we do know, according to Xinhua News Agency now reporting, along with the Nikkei newspaper here in Japan, that uh, Kim Jong-un did go to China uh, apparently for three days, from March 25th to the 28th. We thought it was a one-day visit. Uh, and he did meet with uh, President Xi Jinping in Beijing, according to Xinhua. And also, according to the Nikkei, he met with uh, Vice President Wang Qishan, as well as uh, Yang Jiechi, a senior diplomat, uh, among others, of course. Uh, and there's some interesting headlines passing now across the Bloomberg terminal, uh, basically saying that uh, Kim made an informal visit uh, to China between March 25th to 28th. So it was not a state visit. Also uh, basically saying, uh, she says China-North Korea ties shouldn't and will not change, and they uh, need to have regular uh, re regular talks as well, willing to hold dialogue uh, with the U.S., North Korea telling China that they are willing to have dialogue with the United States. Also, uh, we're learning that Kim Jong-un's wife traveled with him on that train uh, to that China visit. Uh, and uh, again, more headlines. She says he's willing to keep regular contact with Kim and China sticking to Korean Peninsula denuclearization. So again, China uh, pressing hard on that issue that uh, denuclearization is the the ultimate goal. What was the meaning or the meaning of this visit? Well, obviously, ahead of the Donald Trump uh, planned uh, summit uh, by the end of May, China does not want to be left out of this process. And I'm sure Kim is, uh, like his father did, seeking advice from uh, Beijing on just how to talk with the United States and, of course, with Donald Trump. In the fallout from Facebook data leaks, CEO Mark Zuckerberg will testify before the House Energy and Commerce Committee in April. What's the Facebook strategy here? Bloomberg's Sarah Fryer wraps up the latest developments in this report. Zuckerberg came out and said last week that he would be willing to testify if he's the right person to be on the stand. And what we've heard loud and clear from Congress in the last few days is that, yes, Zuckerberg, you are the right person. So now I have sources telling me that he has decided he will testify. Of course, the dates are still in flux. April 12th is one date we heard, but things are always changing on the Hill as they, as they figure out all these other things that they're trying to put together. Um, but certainly Zuckerberg is going to try to come out and, and reassure everyone that Facebook has their best interests in mind when it comes to their data and make sure that uh, they sort of establish with Congress what they know and don't know about the Cambridge Analytica scandal, among other things. A restaurant with a menu made out of emojis has just topped the list of Asia's 50 best restaurants. That's for the fourth consecutive year. Bangkok's Gagan restaurant, renowned for its 25 course tasting menu, uh, depicted only with emoji symbols, has bagged the first place. Uh, Indian accent in New Delhi and Wasabi uh, in Mumbai have also made the list. Let's get you uh, an, an idea of what the best restaurants to eat at are. Great time to end this show on lunch. Time for lunch now. Thanks for watching. We've got countdown up next.